Thank you everybody for coming down and uh, checking out today's session on uh, Windows Server containers. Now I'm trying to gear this session towards obviously .NET developers. Uh, there are a lot of things in containers that have come from the Linux side of the, uh, the shop. Um, and generally speaking, that's you know, the guys like me, the polyglots that have to deal with these big massive distributed environments where we've got Linux on one side, Windows on the other side, and it just makes life very painful. So before we really do get started, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the Turbal and Jagra peoples who are the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mouse, if it'll work, I won't stuff it. And of course, please, and I cannot stress this enough, please support the sponsors of these types of events because I know everybody said it all day long, but without, those, without their support, we don't have these types of events, particularly at this price range. Um, I don't know if a lot of you guys pay for your own tickets to things, but there are quite a lot of organizations where in order to turn up to an event, you're shelling out a couple of thousand dollars of your own money. So when we have these types of community run events, it's really, really, really important that we support the sponsors because, hey, they're supporting us. So, Now, just a, a little bit about myself. My name is Jeremy Cade. Uh, I've been developing software for well over 15 years. I got my start in 98 uh, working on a VB6 application. That lasted all of about 12 months before I went, stuff this, I'm going back to C++. Um, and obviously, um, to keep myself sane, when I'm not banging away at a keyboard, I coach youth baseball, which is where this nice little shirt is from. So I take teams away to national titles every year with the aim of taking a team away to Little League World Series. Um, I'm a husband, father, I've got two small kids, a four-year-old and a one-year-old, and I've got a stay-at-home wife who keeps me, uh, well, well, keeps me poor, essentially. And um, I have something that kind of looks like a formal education. So I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in information technology. So... There we go, mouse is working now. So today's agenda, what are we going to cover? Well, you can kind of think of this as a, as a what, why, where, and, where and how. Uh, not necessarily in that order, but we're kind of going to take a step back and look at what containers are. Um, we'll take a look at why you want to use containers and when you're going to use them. Uh, how to manage that container lifecycle because there's a whole new set of tooling that you'll need to learn. And we'll also take a look at where we can deploy containerized applications. So at the moment, it's a fairly limited story, but you know, those things are going to change over time. So what are containers? Does anybody have an idea? Large metal boxes. Large metal boxes? Yeah, it's pretty much what Google says, large metal boxes. Yeah, your Google foo is strong today, sir. <laughs> So, hey, an object for holding or transporting something. Does that sound like a, uh, a concept that we can use in computing? Don't all speak at once. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, when we think about it in computing terms, containers are a system level abstraction. So, it's really a way of, of taking a, a system as a whole, abstracting away a lot of the uh, complexity of that system. Another way to think of it is having isol isolated processes. So, uh, you know, isolated place where an application can run without affecting other applications or without having the system affect that application. Um, again, I know that most of you guys are Windows developers or develop on the Windows platform and don't necessarily have this problem, but in the Linux space, it is a real problem. Uh, another way to think of it is, you know, containers are a solution for taking an application and being able to deploy it to multiple places and have that application run in the same manner. Um, just quick show of hands, who uses Octopus Deploy? Good. So for the most part in the Windows environment, we don't really have the same types of problems that they do in the Linux environment with taking applications and getting them to run in other places. Uh, for the most part, Windows is pretty good about that. So to understand where containers fit into the Windows ecosystem, we kind of need to understand where they came from in the Linux ecosystem. And they've been around for a while. This isn't a new technology. It's you know, been around for the better part of 15 years. It's just that. For most of you guys, you're just starting to hear about it now because somebody at Microsoft's decided, hey, this is a great new cool thing. And that happens every 15 years or so. So when we take a step back, we really got to start looking at you know, what's enabled this technology. And the first thing that came around is this whole idea of a Linux V server. And this was created by uh, Jacques Scalanus. And the whole idea was to try and separate kernel user space. Now, I don't know if everybody has an understanding of how kernels work, but you essentially have a couple of different parts of uh, the kernel where things are executed. And user space is traditionally the place where our applications are executed. 
So we want to try and separate that away. Now, in 2006, uh, Rohit Seth and Paul Minaj at Google create this thing called process containers. And process containers are a, uh, a way, again, of isolating user space. Now, around 2007, process containers get renamed to control groups, and that gets merged into the mainline kernel for Linux. Now, that kind of makes things a little bit easier. Now, there's another piece of technology, again, that comes along in around 2008 called uh, kernel user namespaces. And again, that's enabling isolation. Now, the other thing that kind of really came about in 2008, which is probably the key part of the whole story, is this whole idea of a Linux container. Now, LXC, as we know it, or Linux containers, was a set of user land tooling created by IBM. It really gave you a nice, simple way of dealing with containers. And when I say simple, I mean it's simple in the cool kid's idea of simple, not the, uh, the Microsoft click and drag way of simple. Um, <laughs> now, around 2013, things start to heat up again. Now, Google, everything in Google practically is deployed in a container of some type. Now, Google actually goes, OK, cool. We're going to make this a little bit easier for everybody that's you know, not a PhD engineer at Google to use. And we're going to give you this thing called Let Me Contain That For You, hence the funny acronym. And it's basically Google's entire container stack. It's Google's open source container stack. And if you're really interested, you can find that on GitHub and dig through it. There's some very complicated C and C++ code in that. But it's worth looking at if you're into that type of thing. Now, again, in 2013, we have this other little company called Dot Cloud, who I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of. You can hear the pins drop, right? So Dot Cloud around 2013 were a pass clouds provider, and they were trying to run everything in containers. So they had this great little product called Docker. And they released that for the first time in 2013. Now, Docker at that point in time was based on LXC, LXC being the Linux containers. Around 2014, we get LXC version 1. So version 1 in Linux land is a big deal, because that basically means the product is stable and everybody can use it. And you don't need to jump through all the hoops of patching your kernels and that type of thing. Same time around 2014, Docker with version 0.9 goes, hey, we're not going to use LXC anymore. We're going to write our own implementation of containers, and we're going to use that. And that gives us you know, a proper Docker runtime for the first kind of time in, in that story. Then you know, between 2013 and today, moving forward, we start getting heaps of other tooling from other providers. So we start getting things like Docker Swarm for managing large deployments of this type of stuff. We get a thing called Fleet. We get this other thing, Apache Mesos, which everybody will start hearing about because Azure supports it. And of course, we're getting things like Google Kubernetes and all these other great tooling. But what does this really mean for us? Why do we care about it? Well, October 2014, Google, uh, sorry, not Google, Microsoft turns around and goes, hey, we're going to bring container support into Windows Server. We're going to work out how we're going to get it done. It might take us a while, but we're going to do it. People like me, we suddenly go, hey, hey. I've been doing this in Linux for a while. I can now do it in Windows. How long do I have to wait? Well, Microsoft doesn't move particularly fast now, do they? So we're waiting around 2015. It's come to the middle of the year, and we get this. So this is DockerCon. DockerCon's in July. And this man here is Mark Rosinovich. Um, does anybody not know who Mark Rosinovich is? He is the CTO of the Azure Org. So he's the guy that's basically in charge of Azure. He makes all the technical decisions and helps plan the things out. He gets up on stage at DockerCon and goes, hey, guys, we have this great little thing called Windows Server Containers. Oh, and by the way, you can now take an ASP.NET 5 application and run that in a Linux container. Oh, but just to make things cool, here's a Node.js application, and we're going to run that on Windows Server in a container. I'm sitting there watching the demo a couple of days afterwards, because obviously I can't afford to fly myself to the States every time there's a cool conference. I'm sitting there back on, hey, I can actually start to do things the way that I've been doing them at scale and other platforms in the Windows space. Cool. Now, the cool thing about this was it was in a technical preview. So this was demonstrated in Windows Server 2016, technical preview 2, with this thing called Nano Server, which is a great lightweight way of deploying Windows. So again, I'm, I'm kind of like this. I'm like, hey, this is really cool. I get to play with this stuff. But there's a few catches, as with all Windows technologies. This stuff's not going to be available in production until sometime in 2016, but it is available today in the technical previews. So again, as I said, Mark's demonstrating all this great technology in technical preview too. 
but it's only for Nano Server. And I don't know how many of you guys have ever tried to deploy a brand new technical preview of Windows Server to a virtual machine or anything like that, particularly when it's in Nano Server. It's great fun, right? I spent about four hours trying to get it to work, and I gave up. Later down the track, they released Technical Preview 3, and when you start getting these things in Windows Server Core, and that's a little bit easier. And I'll, I'll show you some of the Windows Server Core stuff in a bit. But essentially, these things are coming in two flavors. So you know, Microsoft being Microsoft weren't just happy giving us containers. They wanted to give us this other thing called Hyper-V containers. Why? I don't know. I don't work at Microsoft, so I wish I knew. But they're breaking them up. So, and there's some, uh, there are some key differences. Now, Windows containers are available in pretty much all the versions of Windows Server 2016. So Windows Server Nano, Windows Server Core, Windows Server Core with all the GUI and everything else on top of it, all the stuff that we're used to seeing as Windows developers. It's there in the box. It's from Technical Preview 2 and 4. Um, the latest Technical Preview is Technical Preview 4, and that stuff's there in the box, and it's now point and click to install. So it makes it a nice easier. The other thing, the other major difference with this stuff is we get these Hyper-V containers. Hyper-V containers, to us as developers, look the same, act the same. But there are some, as I said, there are some differences. Now, this is where things get interesting. So on the left, we have Windows containers. And if you take a look at that diagram, you can see down the bottom there's a host OS. The host OS can just be you know, Windows Server on a bare metal box. It doesn't have to be in a hypervisor. Above that, we have the host kernel. That's our Windows Server kernel. And then we have user mode, so user land. Remember I was talking about in the Linux land, we need user mode separation. So user, user land needs to be separated out. We need to be able to create new instances of these things. And then each container has its own kind of contained application, but it can share binaries. So Windows containers, we have this idea of being able to take specific container appli uh, containerized applications and have them share specific binaries in that environment if we want. Hyper-V, on the other hand, key difference, Isolation. Hyper-V is more like the traditional virtual machine model. And that is a key thing, and it's something that you do need to be aware of. So if you want to take an application that needs to share some binaries or dependencies on something else, you don't want to deploy it in a Hyper-V container. Now, as I said, from a developer perspective, it's pretty much the same for us. If I build a container application for Windows Server containers, it'll run fine in Hyper-V containers. Makes no difference to me as an application developer does make a difference for the IT pros. So if you have things like PCI compliance and stuff like that, the IT pros are probably going to want Hyper-V uh, Hyper containers versus the Windows Server containers. So we haven't really covered this, but I, I want to stress this. This is really, really important. Windows Server containers are not the same and are not compatible with Linux containers. I cannot take an application, containerize it up for Windows Server containers, and then throw it onto a Linux box and expect it to run. It just will not work. Completely different runtimes, not the same. And that is really a key thing. So I really, if, if you guys take one thing away today, I want you to understand that server containers, the Windows Server containers, are not the same as the Linux container. Now, so far we've been talking really about, or what we're calling containers, we're really talking about runtimes. Now, the runtime essentially, to take a to step back and kind of look at it from an OO perspective or something that we can all relate to, a runtime is like a low-level virtual machine. So think of it like the .NET CLR. We have a CLR that can run a whole stack of different languages. That's our container runtime. So Windows Server containers is essentially our container runtime with some help from Docker and some other bits that are in Windows now. Now we have this other thing called an image. An image is like a base class. So think of it as something that we're going to inherit all these properties from and then build our application on top of it. And that's what our container is. Our container is taking away or basically inheriting all this information from our base class to give us something that we can deploy our application into. So essentially, we're going to take or we build our containerized applications from images and then we're going to run those on a container runtime. Does that make sense? Anybody confused or I left anybody behind? Nope. Cool. So Windows Server, or at least Windows Server 2016, comes with two base images. We have Windows Server Core, and we have this thing called Nano Server. And these are two completely disparate things. Nano Server, if you've been following any of the IT Pro news, um, and predominantly I'm a software engineer, so I, I try and keep abreast of it as much as possible without being an IT Pro. 
Nano Server is a really cut, scaled down version of Windows Server. And it's really built specifically for cloud scale deployments. So it's really funny when you think about it, right? Microsoft was always telling us, oh no, Windows Server's fine, it's not a big bloated beast, until they had to start running Azure. And then all of a sudden we're getting really slimmed down CLRs and slimmed down Windows Server instances. Funny that, huh? The other thing then was Windows Server Core. Now Windows Server Core is our more traditional Windows Server model. So we get all of our .NET, you know, .NET 3.5 are running Windows Server Core. Windows Server Nano will support .NET, like traditional .NET. And I say traditional meaning the current version, not the vNext stuff. But Nano Server is really built for that vNext kind of containerized application. So the two core differences there, Nano Server is tiny, I mean super tiny, Windows Server Core is a lot bigger. So when you look at the base images themselves, Nano Server is about 20 to 30 megabytes, Server Core is anything up to four gigabytes. So you can see there's a massive size difference there. Now as I was saying, we have those base images. We then take our other images and build things on top of those base images. So all of these things here that you can see on the screen, we've got Microsoft ASP.NET, Microsoft Django, uh, Microsoft.NET 3.5, Golang, all these other great things here, right? These are all images built on top of that base container runtime. So what we can do with these is actually spin up an image or a container based on those images that already have things pre-installed for us. So it gives us a really nice way to containerize an application up and throw it over the wall and run our application in it. Now all of, these server, or the, all of these images are available today on Docker Hub. And we'll get to that in a minute. So is that all making sense? Have you guys got a kind of an understanding of what containers are? Everybody happy with that? Any questions so far? Cool. So it kind of brings us to our next question. Why would I want to use containers? Anybody got a, an inkling as to why you might want to? Nada. Reproduce environments. Reproduce environments, that's a good one. Does anybody read uh, the daily WTF here? Yeah? Anybody know who Alex Papadlimus is? So I have emails um, going back and forth with him every now and then because he's, he's a bit of a character. And he runs a little company called Endo, uh, Inendo, which is very similar to Octopus Deploy. They build um, you know, CI servers and build automation deployment stuff. And he's very similar to me in that he has a lot of very strong opinions about a lot of technologies, which makes him quite interesting to speak to. And part of one of my emails was, sent me this back. So his whole thing is that you know, containers are really like, a, I don't know how to say it without cursing it out, but he, he really doesn't like them. <laughs> so he's basically saying like, containers only really existed in the Linux space because Linux is really hard to deal with. When you're deploying applications, it made it really, really hard to get your environment set up in such a way that you could you know, really have reproducible deployments everywhere. So containers really solved the big problem in the Linux thing. It's not necessarily going to save that or have that same solution to the same problem in Windows land. So when we kind of take a step back again and start thinking about these things, and this image is courtesy of Red Hat, they have a great little page about why containers are a thing in Linux. There are some really core key benefits. Um, so for us as, as application developers, kind of the key things are having higher quality releases. So again, that reproducible deployment, which for the most part, a lot of us already solve with Octopus Deploy. Better application scalability. So one of the whole kind of claims about containers is that you know, I'm going to stand my application up once, and I'm going to stand up another 50 straight next to it on the same box. Cool. And then the other thing, again, is that greater application isolation. So again, in Linux land, you have things that are sharing system resources or sharing uh, system DLLs or dynamic libraries if you're in the C++ land. And you can actually destroy an entire box by just patching something. Literally, just bring an entire box down. It might have 50 applications on it. Box will fall to hell. Um, and then on the IT architect side, you know, everybody's like to talk about having faster IT scale outs shorter test cycles, all these types of things. Fuel deployment errors, again, problems that we mostly solve already with Octopus Deploy. Um, and then again, uh, on the IT operations side, it's really all around reducing your overheads and reducing your costs. So, reasons. As I've kind of alluded to, Linux has this dependency hell. 
Now, as we move more and more towards vNext, actually, just quick show of hands, who here has actually started to play with ASP.NET 5? Who here has traveled into dependency hell with ASP.NET 5? Containers are looking like a nice little solution now, aren't they? Dependency hell with ASP.NET 5 applications is an absolute pain, and it's not just on the .NET side if you haven't worked that out already. There's a lot of NPM issues that we as SSW guys run into all the time. Um, the other thing we really want to kind of look at is avoiding configuration environment issues. How many of you, as .NET developers, have taken an application, deployed it to a Windows Server instance, and found out that the .NET facade libraries aren't on that box? And then you sit there downloading 400 megabytes of installer, and then installing, and then rebooting, and then telling client and or customer that box needs to be rebooted and coming down. And then get 50 emails saying, why is the box down? I don't have to worry about that with containers. I just ship everything I need in that container and throw it over the fence. Uh, the other kind of claim about the containers, of course, is that we develop, we build, we package, and then I can throw it over the fence and it'll just run. Cool? Not strictly true in that, as I said, Windows Server containers are not compatible with Linux containers. In Linux space, on Linux land, even that claim itself is not really true because it kind of depends on the version or the flavor of Linux you're running and the version of the kernel that's on it and whether or not you patch specific things. But it's still a lot easier than what it used to be. The other thing, and this is kind of a cool thing, is improved application density. So who here has to run massive big virtual machine farms? How many virtual machines do you have in your farm? 50? So that's a, it's a reasonably small scale deployment. Um, I came from an environment where a large scale deployment is a couple of thousand machines. And managing a couple of thousand machines, not a lot of fun, even with really good IT guys. When we started moving towards containers in Linux land, we started going from a couple of thousand VMs down to a couple of hundred VMs. And that maintenance overhead just drastically drops because it's just so much easier and it's a lot simpler to maintain 100 boxes versus a couple of thousand, particularly with things like configuration drift and all that type of stuff that we all talk about. Now, again, when you start reducing VMs, particularly in Windows land, Windows licenses aren't cheap, are they? They're not. And it's not uncommon to walk into an IT organization and have $60,000 a year in Windows licensing. And that's a conservative number. But if you're reducing the number of VMs you have, that reduces your license cost. Well, guess what? I can run more applications in isolation with one version of Windows Server with more beef to that box because I don't have to share it between 50 other VMs and get better performance metrics. Hell yeah, I'm going to do that all day, every day. The other thing that's really cool about virtual machine, oh, sorry, uh, containers versus virtual machines, because containers are a little bit smaller, they don't need to spin up an entire virtual machine every time I bring a box down. They're going to start up a lot faster. So I'm still going to take my GAC kick because it's a .NET application, but I don't have that extra 20 or 30 seconds of the virtual, spin, virtual machine spinning up if I need to provision a new service. I just provision a new container, throw it over the fence, it spins up in a couple of seconds, off I go. Now, the other reason that you might want to start looking at containers is because it's the cool new thing in .NET land. I'm dead serious about that, by the way. Because if the room isn't starting to look at it, there's a good chance we may get left behind. And you may lose competitive advantage or an IT advantage for your organization, which, believe it or not, is something that is quite important, particularly in a country like Australia. So the other thing we haven't really tested about is you know, the whole testing story. You know, what are you guys doing today for an application deployment and then to testing? Normally, it's you know, git push. Build server brings it down, build, compile, ship it off to Octopus Deploy. Octopus Deploy goes, OK, cool, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to provision something, send it off to a tentacle somewhere. I'll deploy that application. Then my testers come in, and they go, test, 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 and then they send me a stack of feedback. Cool. What version of the application are you running? Oh, we need to roll back to a different version. OK, back to Octopus Deploy. OK, provision, off we go again. That story becomes more complicated when there's an extra virtual machine step involved. So I make the assumption that we have a more large scale or more distributed environment, and you actually need to provision new virtual machines every single time. That becomes a lot more painful, doesn't it? With the container story, I'm not provisioning new machines. I'm basically just going, cool, build my application in CI. I'm going to package it up with Docker or PowerShell, whatever other uh, kind of medium I want to use for that. And then I'm going to ship my image literally directly to my testers, and they can run it on their own machine if they really wanted to. Or I can ship it to them in an environment where they can test against a specific version of that application and send me feedback that's specific to that version. 
So the whole idea is we're going to decrease the time that it takes to get the application in a specific version to the tester so the tester can give us the feedback more quickly. Now, another reason, does everybody remember the Ryujit uh, bug Yeah, July this year? Everybody remember this? Does anybody know what the actual issue was? Little tail recursion problem? Oh, sorry, tail call optimization problem. If you had .NET 4.6 in that unpatched state on a box that had .NET 4.5, does anybody know what happened? It actually affected the JIT compiler for .NET 4.5. So by having 4.6 on your box, even if you weren't using it, it had an impact on your 4.5 application. Guess what? In a containerized world, that doesn't happen anymore. Because that 4.6 dependency or that 4.6 kind of set of framework issues, have no control not involved with my .NET 4.5 application because it's in isolation. Now, it's probably not going to affect a lot of you guys because, again, that was an issue that was really at uh, Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow scale, which the vast majority of us will never have to deal with. But it is the type of issue that we can av avoid by using containers. Now. Containers are a cool technology, but they're not free. It does come with a cost, like all technologies. Um, just a quick show of hands, who was working around the time that virtual machines became the big thing? And we started going from physical hardware to virtual machines. Does everybody remember the pain that that caused? The anti-patterns and the stuff that kept popping up everywhere. IT guys jumping up and down going, we can't do this, it's all too hard. Well, similar thing again. New technologies, new costs. And of course, there's some anti-patterns that come along with new technologies. Because as we see new technologies, we all jump on board. We go, this is great. I'm going to throw everything at it. Please do not throw a legacy application into a container. That is one of my pet peeves. When I see that, I go nuts. And I'm not the only one. The other thing we're really going to keep in mind, too, is this whole idea of, and you, you've heard me kind of talk about it today, I'm going to throw something into a container and then throw it over the fence. That's ignoring DevOps. And one of the key kind of tenets of DevOps is empathy. As developers, we want to have empathy for the poor guys that have to actually run these applications, so the ops guys. So if you're in an environment where there's not a lot of empathy for your IT operations, containers probably aren't going to be a good idea because it creates a, a bit more work for them. The other thing we've got to keep in mind, too, is that with containers, a lot of new organizations or people that just come on board with containers don't go through the traditional QA steps. So they're not really worrying about whether or not those containers or those images that they created are really up to the standard of a normal deployment. They just go, ah, new containers, throw it all together, boom, over the fence. Poor IT guy goes, this crap doesn't work. Fires off support emails, developer goes, I don't care, I throw it to you. No DevOps, no empathy, no QA, all bad. The other thing to keep in mind too, because we can build images on top of images on top of images on top of images, is we end up with these massive big bloated images that have everything that they don't need. And that's what we're trying to get away from. We're trying to get away from having these big massive images that are like big giant bloated VMs. We want to have small containers with just the things that we need to run the applications. So as we're kind of alluding to, containers are not the solution for deploying every single application out of the sun. Like you would not want to take a big relational database system like the Oracle of the world or the SQL Server and throw that into a container. Containers are really built for running small, isolated processes. So things like a website. You know, websites are perfect for it. Or a little microservice or something that has a specific goal. You don't want to take a big, giant application, throw it into a container. We want to try and avoid that where possible because a lot of those things have specific skill sets that are required to maintain and manage them. So. How do we manage the container lifecycle? Any guesses? PowerShell. <laughs> yeah. Docker is really the key tool here. And the reason for it is really around that very first point. If you're coming into a new technology, you want to make sure that there's good documentation. I cannot stress this enough. 
Uh, as, a, as a software engineer that's been working, you know, it's worked across the world in lots of different organizations and different languages with different people everywhere, documentation is key. And if you're coming into a new technology and there is little or no documentation, are you going to have a good experience with that technology? Probably not. And that's kind of where the PowerShell story is today. There's very little documentation because they're still evolving it. So if you wanted to be on the bleeding edge of Windows Server containers, use Docker. If you want to be able to deploy to production in six months or 12 months' time, Docker's probably the better story. Again, why? Consistent APIs. It's battle-tested. Google's using it internally. Uh, Microsoft is using it. Everybody under the sun that's dealing with this container story, either in Linux land or starting to deal with it in Windows land, is using Docker. And there's a very good reason for it. The other major reason is Docker Hub. Docker Hub gives us access to pre-built images that other people have already gone through the hassle of building for us, so we don't need to. And I love it when other people do free work for me, because that means I save my time. The other thing, again, is supported by all the major players. So like I said, you know, it's the Googles of the world, the Microsofts, Amazon. They all support it at some level. And the other kind of cool thing for me is I get to use the same CLI across all the different machines that I have. And that's, again, because I live in a polyglot world. I don't just live in Windows world all day. So most of the time, I'm on a Mac dealing with Linux machines or you know, running virtual machines in Windows or something on this. But the, having that consistent CLI across all the machines makes my life a lot easier because it means I don't need to remote desktop or use RDP terminal services or something to get into a Windows box. I can just use Docker from the machine that I'm on now. Another great reason why you want to use Docker as a Windows developer, that. So here he lives in Visual Studio all day long. So if you wanted to deploy to, say, Windows Azure with your kind of pet project that you just, uh, you're hacking away on at home, are you going to have access to like a full Visual Studio Online build server? Oh, sorry, was it VSTS these days, right? Visual Studio Team Services. Because again, Microsoft changes the name and everything. Um, are you going to have access to a full infrastructure, build servers, Octopus deployment, all that type of stuff? Nope, probably not. It's a little hobby project. Even smaller development shops, you know, two, three engineers or developers, these types of tools help us out tremendously. It gives us the ability to literally publish Docker container, Docker host, where the Docker host could be a Linux container or a Windows container, depending on the way you want to go. And again, this is developed directly by Microsoft, so there is some guarantee of quality. Um, again, I said some guarantee. Doesn't quite work all the time. The other thing that's really cool, if you do have uh, Visual Studio Team Services, what used to be Visual Studio Online, which used to be TFS, whatever they're calling it today, I'm always confused, we actually have Docker build steps as part of the new Visual Studio Team Services build tools. So you can take your normal build, whack in this extra build step, it'll take a Docker file and some other bits and pieces and throw out a container and off you go. So it makes life very, very easy. Now, Josh, sir, to answer your question, Who here likes PowerShell? <laughs> cool. I, I, you may notice that not everybody in the room raised their hand. There were a few people. PowerShell is very, very powerful, hence the name PowerShell. Um, personally, I find that there is a very, very large learning curve with it. And the other thing that I found particularly with PowerShell in the Windows world is not every commandlet is on every machine. Hence the need for things like desired state configuration, which again, if you're a developer and not an IT pro, is another thing that you, again, have to learn. And I only have so much bandwidth for technology. So as I said, if you really want to go down this route, please seriously look at using Docker for the mainstream stuff, again, because there is a lot of better documentation, whereas the PowerShell documentation is sorely lacking at this point in time. So let's actually jump over to my virtual machine here, and see if we can actually get some of these Docker tools working. Now, I make no promises that anything is going to work today. Again, because this is sitting on top of Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 4. And it's sitting in a virtual machine on a rather old machine. So, Now, part of the reason that I'm kind of using an older machine today is I kind of want to demonstrate to you that you can get a lot out of older hardware with Docker and containers and things like that. So 
just to show everybody down the bottom, I don't know if you can see that, but it does say Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 4. Now, this is the most recent version. It was released mid-November. You can go and download this as part of the uh, this Windows Insiders and things like that. You can get a copy of it yourself. The installation is very straightforward. Um, this is just running in VMware, no hypervisor or anything other than you know, my standard stuff that's on this machine. <coughs> Sorry, just give me a second. Um, the other thing you will notice too is this, this version of Windows Server is running the GUI. Now, traditionally, if you're going to deploy containers into a Windows Server instance, you wouldn't have a GUI on it. There's just no need. Um, and that's kind of one of my pet peeves with Windows for the longest time is, generally speaking, to get anything done, you needed the GUI. So just quickly, just to show everybody that Docker is actually on this machine, I'm going to type Docker info. And you guys can see there that I've got no containers at the moment. Now, remember, containers are instances of an image. So they're actually you know, applications that can be run or started or stopped. You can see here that I've got 10 images on this machine. Um, which is quite a lot. And you guys can obviously see as well that the, where is it? The storage driver is the Windows filter and doo -doo -doo, the operating system, Windows Server 2016 Technical Preview 4. Um, the other thing that you should kind of be aware of, if you want to run containers in a virtual machine, make sure you give it at least two virtual CPUs. Now, again, this machine's a little bit older, so it's a 2010 MacBook. I've only got four cores in it. So giving two cores to uh, Windows servers, a bit of a, uh, bit of a stretch. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool to take a note of, uh, number of Go routines there, so 17. Now, Docker itself is actually built entirely in Golang, which I find to be really cool. Um, and the fact that it's running natively on Windows is, is even better for me. So let's actually go and, and take a look, see what images are on this machine. So. Remember before it said that there were 10 images, but here we're only really showing, what do we got there? One, two, three, four, five, six. It's throwing six images. Now, the reason it's showing six images and not 11 is there are intermediate images that sit below some of those top level images. And they're the things that are basically like the building blocks. So think of it like Legos, right? You take your base plate and then you stack a Lego on top. Well, the base plate's your base image, and that'll be Windows Server Core or Nano Server. And then you stick another Lego on top. That might be IIS. So there'll be an IIS image sitting under here somewhere. And then we'll take another Lego, stick that on top. And that might be ASP.NET. And all of a sudden, we've got a container image that can potentially run a full .NET IIS application. Now, one thing to note, too, on this machine at the moment is, can you guys see that all right? Yep, cool. Um, you notice that I've got uh, Python on there and um, IIS. So the ASP.NET image there is the ASP.NET 5 RC1 update 1 image, which is a bit flaky. I've been trying to get that work for the last couple of days. Um, so far, not a lot of fun on this particular machine. Now, another thing to take a quick look at. So we're actually going to look at and see if there are any actively running Docker processes. So PS is basically just show me the processes. And you see there's nothing running. There are no containers that are running on this machine at the moment. If I wanted to see all the containers <coughs> that may be available on this machine to run, I type ps hyphen a, so it's show me all. And again, there's nothing running there. Now, if you excuse me, so I'm a bit lazy, so you guys don't have to see me type all the time. Oh, there it is. Cool, that's right. Now, remember before I was saying that one of the cool reasons, or one of the key reasons you want to use Docker is it gives us access to this Docker Hub, so pre-built images. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say to Docker, hey, tell me about all of the images that you know that are compatible with my operating system and my version of the Docker runtime. So this has actually gone out to the internet now, to Docker Hub, and it's going to come back and show us all these different images. Now, these images specifically are available for Windows Server. And you'll see some of these things say, you know, uh, Django is installed in a Windows Server core. A lot of them are saying Windows Server core there. These are all things that specifically are built for Windows Server core images. You may notice that there aren't a lot or any that say Windows Server Nano.
Now, if I actually wanted to go out and get one of these, like say I want to run Golang on my, uh, wanted to run a Golang application on Windows without having to go and install Golang on my base operating system. Cool, I can do that. So what we're going to do is actually say to Docker, hey, go and get a copy of that image. So Microsoft uh, Golang. And it'll actually go out to the web, provided I type everything properly. It'll go out to the web and pull down a stack of images. Now, you'll notice here it's coming back with a couple of different hashes. They're all base images. So that's why it kind of inflates that image count on my machine. Now, as you can see, the images are, are reasonably small. So these are basically an entire kernel image plus some application runtime environments. So this is the environment for Golang. And it'll probably end up bringing down probably two or 300 megabytes worth of stuff for a base image. Now, compare that to a virtual machine. If I wanted to set up for an entire environment, a virtual machine that had Windows Server, Golang, and I don't know, DNS and everything else set up. How big do you think that'd be? A base image. You're probably looking 60 to 80 gigabytes by the time you're done messing with Windows. A virtual machine? For real? Yeah, for real. Like this full space or just like Yeah. The, the, virtu the actual virtual machine itself, the, the VHD, or um, whatever virtualization technology you're using that's storing the file, is probably going to be anything between you know, 40 to 80 gigabytes, generally speaking, for an application box. That's large, isn't it, compared to a couple hundred meg? So what would you prefer to have in your environment? A whole stack of little Docker images or a stack of virtual machines at a couple of gigabytes? Makes a big difference, doesn't it? Suddenly you have a lot more storage on your SAN. That becomes very costly very quickly. So hopefully this shouldn't take too much long, but while we wait for that one, I'll get another one up. Oh, have some press the right keys. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, all right. So while we wait for that to come down, let's actually go and run a few containers. Now remember before we were talking about containers being isolated? So what we're actually going to do, if I press the right key combinations, we'll run a just straight up standard uh, mouse, work mouse. As you can see my machine is starting to slow down a bit. So we're going to run a, uh, a straight up Windows Server Core instance. Now what this command does, right? I'm saying, oh, oh, full screen, it makes life a little bit easier. Sometimes the keyboard just doesn't play nicely. So what we're going to do here, we're actually going to run, we're going to create a new instance or a new container from the Windows Server Core image. And what this command is telling it to do is say, you know, run a new container with the name ddd underscore demo one so I can identify it easily. If you don't provide it with a name, it'll give it some funky name that has something kind of related to an idea around computer science. So sometimes they come up with like uh, lovely lovelace and things like that. Um, the slash IT parameter tells it to run it interactively. So it'll actually change the color of the screen and you'll see it all go to black and I'll be actually be able to run commands against that container. And the thing at the end is telling it the command to run. So it's going to run PowerShell. So if I hit that, hit enter, that'll actually spin up a new container. That one's still going. And while that one's doing that, I'll spin up a IIS container. So same thing again. We're going to run. Uh, why did they change that in Windows? We're going to run a new container with the name ddd underscore IIS. Slash p tells it to port forward port 80 to port 80 in that container. So this would enable me to set up, say, a IIS instance for a different server or a bunch of different servers. So I could have one application in one instance of IIS on port 81 being forwarded to you know, port 4000, or another instance on port 8080 forwarding to port 80 in that container. It gives me the ability to switch different ports around and do different things based on that box. And again, the command that we're going to run at the end is PowerShell. It's just so I can get into it and actually run it. So that one will spin up. And while we're doing that as well, I'll grab just for good measure, something that's completely different again. You go there, you go there. 
So this is going to be fun trying to work out what's what. Oh, open a new one. Come on. And we'll run another container. We'll run another container that has Python installed on the path. So by now, once everything's finished, is spinning up. There we go. So we got that one spinning up. So if we take a look at this one. So at the moment, the hard thing with this, um, Windows being Windows, is it's actually very, very hard to tell what you've got. Come on, thank you. Or not. So just wait for everything to catch up. Uh, this is the downside of presenting out of VMs, isn't it? Nah. You go away. There we go, so it's still coming down. <coughs> Once we get all of this stuff up and running, so sorry guys, just bear with me. So that's got a container in it. Now, I don't know if you guys can hear it, but the fans on my machine are going nuts. Eight. It's more than likely going to be the recording software that Raj is running. Hey, this worked perfectly fine at home, buddy. As you can see, it's taking a while to refresh everything. So I'm actually going to try and work out now, just based on the command line, what uh, containers we're actually running here. And if it starts getting really slow, I'll kill a bunch of them off. OK, cool. All right, so. At the moment, we're in one container, so I'm just going straight to the root directory and waiting very patiently for it to, uh, to respond to me. Now, as you can see, this is a very, very small instance. There's not a lot in it. So we've got program files, user windows, and we'll see if this is the Python box, pretty simply by typing Python. We may be lucky, or it may crap out. It's take too long to kill it. And this, lady and gents, is why you don't do live code demos. <laughs> so let me just kill all these. So even though I've closed off all those windows, if I come back here and type Docker PS, you can see that I've still got those containers running on this machine. So we'll actually just go in and we'll, we'll attach to one. Now, as you can see on the right-hand side, they've all got names. So I can actually go in and say attach to uh, the DDD ice one. And if all is playing nicely, I might actually be able to get it. But the whole idea is you can run multiple containers on one machine without them interfering with each other. So if all was playing nice in the world, which today doesn't seem to be, but if all was playing nice, I could actually go into each of those containers, modify system files, uh, basically delete the entire registry, and the other containers would still be fine. So I could go into IIS and go, format C, nuke the entire thing. My other two containers would be perfectly fine. There'd be nothing wrong with them. They'd still run, they'd still execute. Now, one of the nice things about this is I can treat my containers like they're cattle. They're basically just herd. I don't have to worry about them. I can underfeed them. I can you know, take them out for the slaughterhouse. I can do whatever I want with them because they're not pets. They're not big, beefy virtual machines that if they fall over, somebody's going to complain. I can just kill them, stand a new one back up, which I will do. Just nuke all these and stand them up again. Come on. No, they're all Windows containers. 
So one of the key limitations of uh, the Hyper-V containers is the need to have uh, the Hyper-V redirection. So essentially, because I'm running on a virtual machine already, I need to have another layer of Hyper-V on top to run the Hyper-V containers. Now, the cool thing about the Hyper-V containers is you could take your traditional bare metal hypervisor, so it could be ESXi or Zen hypervisor or just standard Hyper-V, and deploy a container straight to it. You don't even need Windows there. Containers will just, or the Hyper-V container will deploy its own kernel and everything straight on top of it. And that is really a powerful story because it gets you bare metal performance with a container without the need for a, an operating system. Um, so just give me a second, I will kill all these containers, and we'll move on. Do the Python. So these will actually take a little bit to stop them, so I can kill them. The other thing I could do would just be to completely reboot the VM, but that kind of defeats the point. <sighs> and as you guys can see, this stuff obviously is not ready for prime time. Technical previews being technical previews. Cool. What else am I doing today? So if I just go quickly. So you, you can now see that all those containers have stopped. So hopefully my machine will come back to being something that looks like a responsive machine. And we'll just grab the IIS. Container will spin that back up. Oops. All I have to do is start it. Quick question, Jeremy, while you're uh, plugging wires. Yep. So because these uh, images are sharing that one layer, do you have to worry about the whole security issues about you know, leak from one container to another? That's a Linux problem. And the reason why that's a problem in Linux, more so than it is a problem in Windows, Windows has much better isolation than Linux traditionally. Um, and again, this comes back to what Alex Papadimus had said about you know, Windows is starting a lot later. Windows as a kernel is a lot more granular and a lot more compartmentalized than the Linux kernel is. So when you look at the traditional Linux kernel, they refer to it as being a monolith. With the more modern Windows kernel, there's a whole lot of things that have come in from that whole MinWin project. Um, did anybody ever hear about that, the MinWin project? The basic idea of taking the massive Windows kernel and streamlining it down and only having the things that were needed? Well, process isolation was kind of there for the most part in the beginning. It just wasn't exposed in the same way that it was in the Linux kernel. So in reality, Windows, the Windows team hasn't really had to do a lot to enable this type of technology. All right. So, so we should have cool. So uh, what do I need to get out of that? So I should be able to attach to this now, hopefully. Lovely Docker demos that never work. There you go, at least it's thinking about it. Actually, how are we doing for time? Cool. All right. There we go. So now we're actually in the Windows Server uh, container. And if I uh, just pull up the directory, you should see that we've got INET pub there. And we can actually go in here now. And I can make my way down to wroot as everything catches up. Ay, ay, ay. So we'll just kill this. Sorry, let me just kill these off. This isn't working. Now my demos have gone to crap. Now, for the most part, if you're interested in seeing some really good demos, um, Mark Rosinovich has put together some, some very nice demos over the last couple of weeks, particularly around managing these things with PowerShell um, and remoting into different machines. What I was hoping to get to today was actually packaging up containers and uh, moving them in to Windows Server and actually getting them running. So just to quickly show everybody again, if I, uh, you can see we had those three containers that were running at some point. We can actually then go and remove those containers to say we no longer want to spin these things up. 
I can basically just say you know, docker remove and then give it a name, the container. So then if I go back and say, show me what's there, you see I've actually removed that container. So if I wanted to reinstantiate a copy of that image or that instance, I'd actually have to go and recreate it again. So I'd have to go docker run and stand it back up. If I didn't want to uh, delete the container, I can leave it on the machine, which is perfectly fine. So you can start and stop containers as you need to. Nice thing about that is they don't eat up system resources. Um, the other nice thing about containers too, at least in the Windows space more so than Linux space, is you can actually find that file system on disk. So I could, if I really wanted to, I can dig through program files, find where those files live, modify them without having to go into the container. Not necessarily the nicest way to do it, but it can be done. So anyway, moving on. I'll just kill this. It doesn't. Come on. Patient, patient, patient. Cool. All right, so moving along. I do apologize about the demos. Um, so let's make the assumption that all my demos worked out really, really well, and we have a nice little container sitting there, and everything's running happily. I know it was a great demo, wasn't it? I feel ecstatic about that demo. I'm so happy. All right, so moving along. Um, where can I deploy containerized applications? So keeping in mind we're talking about Windows Server containers and not Linux containers. Kind of the key answers here at this point in time, your traditional infrastructure as a service cloud providers will allow you to stand up Windows Server 2016 technical preview for instances. Um, you'll probably have a little bit more luck running those instances in the cloud than you would on a 2010 MacBook. Azure has a nice little way of setting up what they're calling a container host VM. So it basically gives you a nice kind of point and click uh, experience for setting up technical preview for with a container service and everything already there, ready to go. Um, the downside is that it is server containers only. It does not support Hyper-V. Thank you, gents. Uh, your other option, of course, is setting up something on-prem. So if you have uh, access to a Blade server or something similar, you can drop Windows Server on there and off you go, set up the container services, whatnot. Um, setting up container services on Windows Server is fairly straightforward. They give you a nice little PowerShell script that goes out and pulls everything down for you, pulls down a base image and gets you going. But on the sad side today, as it stands, there are no pass solutions, which I know a lot of organizations are moving towards that pass solution um, simply because they're sick of managing IT infrastructure. Now, it is something that has been kind of alluded to in Microsoft's roadmap that there will be a pass solution for Windows Server containers. There is already a pass solution with all of the cloud providers, so Azure, Amazon, Google, all of the bigger guys, for Linux containers today. So I could develop a Linux container and deploy it to basically a pass solution for containers if it was the Linux side, but nothing for the Windows side today because you know, it's a technical preview. Things are still changing. So even though the stuff I talk about today with technical preview 4, there's no guarantee that it will be the same again in technical preview 5 or technical preview 6 or when they find a release at some point in 2016. So what are the main takeaways from today? The main things I would really like to try and get across to you. Windows Server containers really do come in two flavors. There's Windows Server containers, essentially, and then there's the Hyper-V containers. Key difference there, again, Hyper-V containers have more isolation. You can deploy them directly to a hypervisor, and off you go. Windows Server containers, you still need Windows Server 2016. Not as much process isolation, but you still do have something. We've got two different types of base images. So there's Windows Server Core, which, has, which will enable you to do your more traditional .NET development. So that's .NET Current. Windows Server Nano is the thing that's really built for cloud scale, smaller deployments, that type of stuff. Really good for microservices if you want to go down that route. The key thing as well, Windows Server containers are not the same as Linux containers. They are not compatible. You cannot take a Linux container and run it in Windows Server. You cannot take a Windows Server container and run it on Linux. In terms of the tooling, Use Docker rather than PowerShell. Why? It's just a lot easier. You get a standard API you can use across platform. Um, if you're in a mixed technology environment, it makes life a lot easier. And you've got much better documentation for those APIs. And hopefully, if everything falls in a line and all the ducks are lined up and everybody's happy and we pray to the right gods facing the right directions and MacBooks are happy, we may get something that looks like production-ready Windows Server with containers in early to mid-2016. Now, something that I, I would really appreciate is a lot of feedback on this session. So one of the things that I am very conscious of as a uh, software engineer is feedback. 
Um, we've had some pretty good feedback in the last couple of six or in the last six months. And I've had some not so great feedback. The not so great feedback is the stuff I'm really after because that helps me become a better engineer, helps me become a better consultant, and a whole, better at a whole lot of things. So all feedback is good feedback as far as I'm concerned. And more importantly, if you want one of these nice little things that you'll see most of the SSW guys rolling around with, submit your feedback because you don't submit your feedback, you don't get a chance to get Microsoft banned. And believe me, they're a very, very good Fitbit. Not so great as a Windows, um, sorry, as, a, as an Android watch, but they're pretty good as a little Fitbit. So, any questions? They're not VMs. You don't have to worry about it because you're only running one instance of Windows Server. You pay one license cost. That's it. You can run as many containers as you want. So as far as the licensing is concerned, particularly if you go through the Euler at the moment for the technical previews, it's alluding to the fact that the licensing is still going to be like per core or uh, per instance of, of uh, Windows Server. But as far as containers are concerned, I run as many containers as I want. Because at the moment, you think Microsoft's going to turn around and go, well, you want to run five applications on your Windows server, you now have to pay the Windows server license plus five application license. Like, yes, they used to do it traditionally with cows. Oh, you want to have five people log in? Well, that's five cows. You want another five? Well, there's another five cows. But I don't see that happening with Windows server. If they were to do that, they would be shooting themselves in the foot. Personally, that's, that's what I really think. I think they would shoot themselves in the foot by doing that. Because guys like me that make those technology decisions, if they were to turn around and go, well, it's now going to cost you another 15 grand a year or 15 grand per license to have five containers running, I'll go, fine, I'll go run them on Linux. Not a problem. I pay no license cost. And that's what the market is there. That's the competition. And that's part of the reason why they need to head in that direction. Make sense? Yeah, you can. Sorry, I didn't go through that today, but you can create your own base images. Um, there are a couple of ways of doing it. So Windows Server side, you can create them with PowerShell. You can basically take one of those kind of Windows Server core base images and then install additional things on top, so like IIS or ASP.NET or whatever you needed. You then package that up into a new image. And then you can use a thing called a Docker file if you're in the Docker space. And you basically set out in that Docker file, you say, like, I want to inherit from image A and I need this thing to run, and then this thing to run, and then this is how you run my application. And it allows you to package up your entire container image like that. Again, throw it over the fence to ops, or throw it over the fence to your development team, and we all go, cool, I'm going to inherit from package B, and I'm going to deploy my container like that. So there are ways to do it. Um, it's a bit hard with a limitation of 45 minutes to get through all that type of stuff. Uh, the documentation is really good around that, and there is a lot of best practice, particularly coming from the Linux space, because again, the companies that are, that are really moving fast in that space have all been doing it for 18 to 24 months already. So it is, it is a fairly straightforward process. Uh, the process with Windows at the moment is still a bit buggy, but it is getting there, and it'll probably be there in the next 6 to 12 months. And uh, can you host those images on Docker Hub? You can. You can host them on Docker Hub. Um, whether or not you'd want to is a different story. Again, traditionally in the Windows side of, uh, of the operations, we don't push our custom containers and our custom applications and those types of things into the cloud because generally they're proprietary. Most organizations running Windows are probably working on proprietary bits. And that's reality. Linux land, people tend to be a bit more open with things and they'll push custom images and that type of stuff. Um, Docker does have a paid subscription for Docker Hub, so you can host your own images there. But whether or not... Could you like do, if you, if you were a company like Octopus Deploy, could you put like a, hey, download our containerized Octopus instance and try it out on your machine? That's an option too. And um, going back to Octopus Deploy, I'm sure if everybody kind of pushes Paul just gently, or uh, Demo if you find him, we might get something that looks like Docker support for Octopus Deploy in some way, shape, or form. All good? Done? Cool. I got to run. Thank you very much, guys. As I said, please leave the feedback. I appreciate it. Good feedback is good. Bad feedback, even better. <laughs>